Hello. This is the second part of a lecture on Frank O'Hara's poem. Lana Turner has collapsed. I was trotting along and suddenly it started raining and snowing and you said it was hailing, but hailing hits you on the head hard. So it was really snowing and raining and I was in such a hurry to meet you, but the traffic was acting exactly like the sky and suddenly I see a headline, Lana Turner has collapsed. There is no snow in Hollywood. There is no rain in California. I have been to lots of parties and acted perfectly disgraceful, but I never actually collapsed. Oh, Lana Turner, we love you. Get up. So we said last time that the speaker in this poem is telling somebody, we don't really know who, about a headline that they glimpsed when they were hurrying on their way to meet this person. Lana Turner has collapsed and Lana Turner is a movie star. The speaker says that it's been raining and snowing rather than hailing. And we said that when we're talking about the weather, we're often talking about feelings. We're not really sure who they're meeting, but towards the end of the last video, we came up with a kind of hypothesis about this poem. We suspected that the speaker of this poem is late. They've just arrived to this rendezvous and they're a little bit late or maybe very late. So with that in mind, let's think about the addressee the mysterious person that we haven't been able to say much about yet. So this is the 1960s. Nobody has mobile phones. So when you meet somebody, you say, let's meet at such and such a place and such and such a time. And if you get there and the other person isn't there, then what? Maybe you leave. More likely you wait. How long do you wait? Depends. Depends on what? Depends on lots of things. What do you do while you wait? You don't go on your phone. Maybe you have something to read. Maybe you think about the person that you're supposed to eat, supposed to be meeting. Um, like, what do you think? You think, wow, I can't wait for them to get here. You think, I wonder what's keeping them. I hope they're okay. I hope it's nothing serious. I bet it's nothing serious. They're often late. What are they doing? Are they hurrying to meet me? I wonder if they're thinking about me. I can't, I can't have forgotten, Shirley. No, they can't have forgotten. They're always late. They're often late. For me, they're, they're often late. Maybe they're not coming. That makes me, that makes me feel sad. I'm kind of relieved. Well, I, I'm not sure how I feel. How much longer should I wait? How do I really feel about this person? How, how do they really feel about me? You know what? I'm, I'm going to go. No, I'm... I'm going to give it, I'm going to give it 10 more minutes, no, five more minutes, and then I'm going to go. So those are, those are the kinds of things that maybe, maybe you think about. And if that's the state of mind that the speaker is anticipating from the you in this poem, from the addressee, how might that be shaping the words here? So in this poem, the addressee never actually speaks. We kind of maybe hear something secondhand about this, the addressee saying something about um, it, it being hailing. But silences, there are different kinds of silences and silences can kind of have their own structure, maybe a kind of crystalline icy structure and that structure can be shaping these words and these meanings that are unfolding. So how might the kind of silence or the kind of listening in which this poem is embedded be shaping the sense that it's making?
Why mention the weather so much? Well, one reason is that the weather makes a lot of difference to what waiting is like. Um, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry I'm late. You're completely soaked. Or, you know, you've had to huddle under this um, bit of shelter rather than sit on the nice park bench in the sun. What about this phrase, the traffic was, exact, was acting exactly like the sky? So when you're late, maybe you say, sorry, the traffic was bad. And maybe it was bad, and it's no lie, but things can be true and sound like a lie. And anyway, it's a kind of hackneyed, platitudinous way to try to wriggle off the hook. Plus it conjures up that kind of situation you are the hook and I'm the worm. Sorry I'm a little late. A little late? Well, traffic was bad. It's not that bad. Besides, traffic's always bad. Anyway, couldn't you have got a cab? I just said traffic was bad and besides, there's no cabs. It's the weather, it's this weather, it's everybody's getting cabs. And I said I was sorry. I hurried to get here, I was in such a hurry, I don't even know why I bothered. And so on. But instead, the speaker says the traffic was acting exactly like the sky. So how's that different from saying, oh, the traffic was bad, the traffic was terrible. I'm so sorry. Traffic. Traffic. Well, what aspects of the sky and the traffic are being compared? I'm, I'm not sure. The busyness? Both are kind of busy, confusing, inconvenient, unpredictable, obnoxious, um, heavenly, decreed, you know, like out, outside of my control. I can't control the weather. I can't control the traffic. I can't. Uh, we disagreed about both these things. We, we disagreed about the sky. We might disagree about the traffic, but I'm, I'm not really mentioning the traffic. Well, I mentioned it, but I didn't bring it up. I didn't bring it up as a subject. I'm just setting the scene here for you. Um, maybe the, maybe the, the raindrops, the snowflakes, the hailstones, whatever they are, maybe they're like little vehicles. Maybe each kind of globule of precipitation, um, the cars and bikes as raindrops and the taxi cabs as snowflakes and the lorries as ice pellets or the big lorries as uh, hailstones. Um, I think of lanes as well, slow lanes, fast lanes, pedestrians, bikes, motorbikes weaving uh, like letters in an anagram shuffling round and round. Um, the traffic, you know, I, it's, I'm not saying it was bad traffic. Who am I to, to judge the traffic or, or to judge the sky? But boy, it was complicated, messy, noisy, fascinating. But I've hardly even mentioned the traffic. This is, this is about the news. I'm talking about the news. I'm talking about this headline. I'm talking about Lana Turner. How about those words... The traffic was acting exactly. Can you maybe hear a sort of shuffled, chaotically rearranged echo of the phrase taxicab? So sometimes an unspoken concept or thought hovers within a conversation and shapes its course. L late might be one of these words. Is Lana Turner late? The late Lana Turner? And with all this kind of fuss about the hail, it's a little bit speculative, but I wonder if there's a kind of spectral taxi cab here. Um, after all, you can hail a cab, can't you? You can collapse into a cab. Collapse and cab, we might call that a collocation, which means when two words 
turn up together in each other's company more than can be explained by coincidence. Um, Collapsing into a cab probably isn't a very strong collocation. An example of a strong collocation would be wreaks havoc, two words that are um, continually in each other's company. But maybe taxi cab is a kind of lacuna in this poem, a kind of gap. And maybe it's a kind of taboo as well. Maybe this is a record of effective labor to preempt the temptation to slip into mutual evaluation and judgment. And any mention of a taxi cab would be likely to spark those kinds of attitudes, that kind of crossness and defensiveness. So compare this poem, which I actually wrote myself. What do you notice? What's what's the big difference? <laughs> if we're talking about lacuna and things that are missing, things that are absent. See, now that we're supposing that the speaker is late, we can return to some of our earlier speculations and questions from the first video. How late is he? Maybe, maybe that's up for debate, but how do I claim that I've been approaching swiftly, but not that swiftly, because lateness is all relative, and between you and me, this doesn't count as, as late. And how do I do that while also claiming that I'm kind of harmless and ridiculous and not very capable of inflicting injuries and I'm also kind of kind of quite cute and quite special? Well, I can do all that with one word. I was trotting. What about rain and snow? So if he is late, then what about this admonition that hail is the wrong word? And also, what about this omission of the, of, of the option of sleet? Well, meeting someone in the rain or snow, okay, it, it might be kind of annoying, unpleasant, but there's a kind of romance to it, especially in New York. Meeting in the sleet, meh. Maybe sleet is kind of gloomy. And maybe sleet also is less fluttery. It's precise. It is pedantic. Okay, well, what about meeting in the hail? Well, you may think there's romance in that, but hail, hail is too much. Hail hits you on the head hard. I think that's what this poem is suggesting. Raining and snowing is light and ephemeral and effervescent. And there's something quite gratuitous and extra about it, raining and snowing. It's a kind of abundance. Should I get the chocolate or the uh, butter pecan caramel? You know what? Why not both? Shall we meet at noon or 12.30? You know what? Why not both? And perhaps another reason why sleet is not the speaker's style is that he has a kind of predilection for extremes. Snow, rain, hail, but not some middling mishmash. Or a predilection for certain extremes, perhaps, um, or a attraction to certain extremes. He also says, I have acted perfectly disgraceful, but I never actually collapsed. And if I am somebody who likes to amble or to gallop, what a kind of gift, what a, an honor I'm bestowing on you that I am willing to trot along to meet you, to take that kind of middling swiftness to get where you are. And in fact, later on, he's in such a hurry. And now that sounds like more of a hurry, but it's not his opening gambit. I was in such a hurry. By midway in the poem, I was in such a hurry. Such is um, such an interesting word. It can mean to a great degree, which is what it means here, its main meaning. 
it can also mean to a certain degree. Or it can mean in a manner previously described. In such a hurry, as I have characterized, I came to meet you. In what kind of hurry? In a trotting hurry. So can we think of any other reasons to insist on rain and snow rather than hail or sleet? Spend even more time with this weather. Why might the speaker make that choice? To tease, maybe? Maybe to get it wrong on purpose? It definitely wasn't hailing. Here is my extremely meteorologically legitimate definition of hail. Really, it was snowing and raining. Why would you get things wrong on purpose? Why do we deliberately get things wrong? Lots of reasons. The compulsion to self-sabotage. The desire to feel underestimated. A kind of flattery. Um, our, our sense of our interlocutor's desire to feel powerful. Sometimes we might get something wrong to solicit a correction because we think we might enjoy being corrected or that the other person might enjoy correcting us. Sometimes we might get something wrong to see if we can get away with it, to tempt the other person to correct us while suspecting that they will resist this temptation and so forgive us a small indiscretion. Could that be relevant? Perhaps the speaker is reminding the addressee what it feels like to forgive a small indiscretion, a small indiscretion or, you know, a, a small mistake, like not knowing the word for sleet or like being 10 minutes late. Okay, maybe more like half an hour. Plus the speaker is performing pedantry, precision, performing being a stickler, but performing that kind of pedantry with a glitch. Is there a suggestion there that even people who think they know absolutely everything and have got it 100% right are still liable to make little mistakes that they don't know about? I'm telling you exactly the right term for the freezing stuff falling from the firmament and this and no other term will do. And I'm so certain about it. I'm telling you twice in this poem. And the second time, it's actually a little different. Because even a very confident pedant can get it a little wrong. Did we really say 12? Or did we say about 12? Why else insist on rain and snow? It's invoking a cosmos where potentially contradictory states can coexist. If it's raining and snowing, that suggests that if things are marvelous and miraculous, but incompatible, well, they don't have to cancel out or reach some kind of compromise, some kind of consensus like sleet. And I was in such a hurry to meet you, but the traffic was acting exactly like the sky. And suddenly I see a headline, Lana Turner has collapsed. There is no snow in Hollywood. There is no rain in California. I have been to lots of parties and acted perfectly disgraceful, but I never actually collapsed. Oh, Lana Turner, we love you. Get up. I'm really not sure how to read that, that final line, which is the line that is the, the, the most memorable and kind of famous and, and quoted line of this relatively famous poem. Um, there's something quite epif epi, um, epiphany, epiphantic about it. Um, the, there's something quite, quite arch about it. There's something quite witty about it. There's the sense that Lana Turner is, is suddenly present, that Lana Turner can, can hear the speaker. There's the sense that Lana Turner is still collapsed um, where, wherever, she, wherever she felt that 
this state has continued. So maybe this kind of teasing insistence on rain and snow, snow and rain, not hail, is a way of saying, you are being too precise. You're being um, unpleasingly definitive. You're being merciless. You're being just perhaps, but you're not being forgiving. We can choose at how we look at things, you know, and how we look at them sometimes changes what those things are. And we see in this second part of the poem that these earlier meteorological claims get, uh, they get trumped by even more flamboyant claims, like they were kind of testing the water. There is no snow in Hollywood. There is no rain in California. Now, I'm not sure here, but I think that the kind of overt surface level meaning is something like um, it's, it's not snowing in Hollywood now, not this time of year. It's not going to be raining in California. Uh, what's Lana Turner's excuse? But it is also giving me a, a faint sense of um, a grander claim. Um, a, a gesture towards something more permanent and persistent. That there is always sunny weather in Hollywood and California. And Hollywood here suggests movies and cinema contains glimmers of utopia. It's kind of beauty, um, the, the imaginativeness of cinema, the perfectibility of things that have been created for the screen, the, the feelings that movies can excite, um, the way they can show, show you things that are outside of your own lived experience. Um, and maybe even outside of anyone's lived experience. So this is a poem about stars. And it's a poem about the heavens and what they have in store for us. Um, weather can be described as inclement, i.e. unforgiving. There's something kind of ominous in the second part of the poem. No snow and no rain might gesture towards this eternal utopian sunniness, but no rain also suggests famine. Starvation, devastation, and then suddenly there are these parties. I have been to lots of parties. So we might build up a reading which is very critical of this speaker and their careless attitudes to the feelings of the you in this poem and the speaker's apparent obsession with shallow celebrity goss. Or maybe we might read the poem as an extraordinarily artful apology. Or we might read it as an attempt to find a route to forgiveness which does not go via apology. Why might the poem be suspicious of apologies? Now, there is a kind of ethos um, that exists out there that says, like, uh, it doesn't matter what other people think about me. Haters are going to hate. I'm never going to apologize. I'm never going to regret. Um, you do you. I'll do me. Um, it doesn't matter what other people think about me. And I don't think that's what we're dealing with here. I think there is a suspicion of apologies, but it's not that kind of suspicion. I think the speaker would actually think that that is a terribly dull attitude, um, not even to care what other people think about you. It is fascinating what other people think about you. So of course you could just say, like that earlier made up poem said, I'm so sorry I'm late and move on. 
Of course, that's always an option. But apparently the polite, perfunctory apology isn't adequate for this speaker and for these circumstances. So what about a really good apology? Well, what are the features of a really good apology? You fulfill your reparative obligations. You, you do everything you can to heal or to compensate for the harm that you've done. Your apology is a, is a practical thing as well as words. Um, if the harm that you've done involves feelings, that's complicated. A good apology probably also comes with a guarantee, whether it's overt or just implied, that you won't do it again. And we might suppose that a good apology is also heartfelt, sincere. It's animated not just by instinctive remorse, but by thoughtful remorse that has been informed by some process of empathy and compassion, some process of self-searching, self-criticism, perhaps self-transformation. I will be a good person. I will leave a little bit earlier to compensate for weather and traffic. And a properly formulated apology also generates quite a strong obligation to forgive. Apologies can be forms of power, ways of, of doing power, of exerting agency that involve other people. If somebody's really genuinely sorry and they've done everything that they can to make it up to you, aren't you a bad person if you don't forgive them? Don't you have to find it in yourself to forgive them? Um, so this is a, a short quote from a recent essay by Namwali Serpel. The slippage between emotional empathy and the good in our public discourse, in other words, the, the way that empathy and um, goodness, virtue are kind of conflated, they slip together presumes that when we do feel the suffering of others, we are prompted to relieve it. But this is not always true. Sometimes we just want it to go away. So it's often presumed that sharing feelings is an uncomplicatedly positive thing. And I definitely get that. It's a important corrective to toxic individualism, to, um, you know, too many people bottle up their feelings. Um, and we, we should live in a society where we do share our feelings and talk about our feelings more. But that said, the propagation of one inner state into the material circumstances of other people's lives is a complex and sometimes unpredictable thing. Um, it's going to, different feelings are going to take on new significances depending on who's having them. Um, and there's a lot of quite interesting writing recently, particularly feminist theory, around whether empathy in particular is a adequate grounds for ethics. Um, if we take the example of the poem and we think about whether this is actually necessarily a moment that calls for empathy, well, I'm not quite sure. There might be a suspicion of apology here because apology is a mechanism for ultimately discharging debts, creating consensus, redressing some kind of balance and becoming equals again but perhaps becoming equals in a way in which important differences are smoothed away. And if that mechanism for kind of writing everything and um, clearing the air and becoming equals again without this um, kind of debt or, or injury hovering between you, if the mechanism for doing all that involves one of you showing empathy for the other, and if that empathy involves absorbing that kind of spirit of maybe spiteful woundedness and pettiness, and if you've only got one afternoon together, and if it's a kind of 
busy, beautiful city um, filled with uh, excitement, um, perhaps you might want to explore other options for being together. And one of those options, I think, would be to discover that the injury has fallen behold, but below some kind of threshold, some kind of threshold where it deserves to be um, evaluated and where some kind of judgment and reconciliation needs to be made. So I think this is partly a poem about um, thresholds and about extremes and moderation a poem about spectrums and where things are falling on those spectrums and the extent to which they can be nudged, placed, positioned on those spectrums. Um, and we see that in the way that weather is talked about, how there are these kind of ambiguous transitional states. Um, where does the threshold lie between hail and rain and snow and perhaps sleet? Um, where is the threshold between not late and a little late and very late? And these themes of moderation and excess play out particularly in this final part where the speaker says that they have been to lots of parties and acted perfectly disgraceful, but never actually collapsed. Um, which I think is a bit of a humble brag, really. Uh, I get invited to a lot of parties. Um, you know, I'm very much in demand and I usually disgrace myself at these parties, but the invitations actually keep coming. So, and anyway, who arrives early to a party? Who even arrives on time? So anyway, what do you want to do? I wonder if it could be a date. Could be a date. So we've said that this is a poem perhaps about being late and it's a poem about love or friendship or romance or certainly spending time together. And it's a poem about mechanisms of judgment, reconciliation and forgiveness and particularly maybe um, a kind of prior state in which there is the possibility of such mechanisms coming into play, but also the possibility of such mechanisms being suspended. Um, and I think as part of that, the poem is flirting with this kind of literary and artistic tradition of memento mori, um, which is a Latin phrase meaning roughly, I guess, remember death. Um, which is Christian in its origins. It goes back a really long way, but here it has a kind of secular manifestation. You've been waiting for such a long time. I was in such a hurry. Let's not be defensive or cross. I'd like to get back in your good graces. We both know I'm not perfect. Nobody is. We are fallen. We are we are not perfect. It was bad of me to be late, I guess, but it would be worse of me to try and lie and pretend that I won't be late next time. In fact, the only kind of perfect I am is perfectly disgraceful. Although I never actually collapse, but, but I might collapse. I might collapse, you know. Slippy out there, and I don't seem to have the best grasp of the properties of water and ice. Now, don't be cross with me, because any of us could collapse any day. I could collapse. I could be hit on the head hard. So, um... And actually, I think the speaker is kind of tacitly admitting to, to having messed up, maybe not in um, 
quite such an extreme way as I, as I just implied, but they are, are kind of owning some kind of small injury done um, and showing some kind of intimate care caused to the, ad the addressee. But I don't think they are doing that in the form of an apology. Um, so what does the <laughs> what does the poem offer instead of an apology? Lana Turner, love, the weather, traffic, the city, the sky, the parties, collapsing, not collapsing, and himself. And I was just reminded of this little quotation, um, which is spoken by a character in Oscar Wilde's play, Lady Windermere's Fan. It's absurd to divide people into good and bad. People are either charming or tedious. So I wonder what you think about that and what you think about that in relation to the poem. And of course, um, Oscar Wilde isn't some kind of hyper-individualistic, uh, hedonistic relativist who says that every should, everybody should just be kind of selfish and run around doing whatever they want. Um, Oscar Wilde is a socialist, um, although I don't think that character was. Um, so we've done a kind of case study of a uh, close reading there. We've looked at the poem in some depth, a lot of it based on this somewhat fragile presumption that the speaker of the poem is late, has arrived late for some meeting. And we've touched on some of these themes, although I think a lot of them um, could be looked into in more depth and could provide the basis for other strong readings of this poem. I suggested celebrity. Lana Turner, you could talk more about Lana Turner. Um, I've only very, very briefly mentioned her. And you could talk, I think, also about um, uh, time and tense. I think time and tense in this poem are very important. The, that final line does something really interesting. The fact that it's Lana Turner has collapsed um, not Lana Turner collapses, which is, a, you know, the tense that's often used in newspaper headlines. You could talk about being gay in the 1950s and 1960s USA. This is a period that's a little bit before um, Stonewall, the Stonewall riots, which if you don't know about, I would very much recommend that you go and look up after this video and find out a little bit about to get a sense of the, um, the time at which this poem was written. Um, a little bit before uh, the gay civil rights movement in America. Um, you could talk about Hollywood and the movies. You could explore that a little bit more. You could think about lyric expression. What kind of, what kind of uh, speech act is this that's captured on the phrase, uh, on the page? Is it a kind of memory that is a condensation of things that the speaker in some um, in some kind of reality, in some kind of um, fantasy, said and then had a response to? Is it some kind of um, condensation, compression, transformation of a dialogue? If so, what is being left out and why? Um, and is, is leaving out, is that really the, the right way of thinking about it? How does it relate to conversation and how does it relate to song? You could think about secrecy and subjectivity. So this is a poem that withholds certain things and we've done a close reading that has been quite meddling and intrusive and trying to wring as much sense out of every single detail as we can, but it keeps a lot of secrets. So what does that tell us about the poem? What does that tell us about poetry? Parties, we've barely talked about them and they seem to be important to this poem. We've touched on some of these theological themes, grace, disgrace, mercy, forgiveness, the heavens. You could explore that more fully. And what if our assumption or our, um, our, our hunch, our, um, you know, our, our educated guess that this speaker was late, what if that's wrong? What if he was right on time? Go back, read the poem, think about it from that perspective and perhaps a whole new interpretation will emerge. We've talked a little bit about apology, forgiveness, empathy. We've talked a very little bit about the city, but I think you could talk about that some more, perhaps in relation to this theme of individualism as well. Um, one potential critique of the speaker and the um, elegant 
mechanism that the speaker uses to forego or apology is that there's a kind of disposability and fungibility of persons that underlies it. In other words, if you're in a city that's kind of crammed with interesting people, maybe you don't ever have to apologize because if you find somebody who demands apologies of you, you can just kind of cut them. You can find replace them with, with somebody who doesn't, who's somebody who doesn't ask you to go through these processes of um, potentially risky self-transformation um, where you, you risk opening the floodgates to forms of self-recrimination that are not associated with the particular um, cause and origin of the um, of this apology. Um, so apologies are, are, are risky, but is there something about a big populous city that means that we don't take that risk as much as we should because we just feel that we can find friends that don't ask those sorts of things of us? And that links together with this other theme of the public, um, as well as the private, the public, private, counter publics, subcultures, um, uh, individuals, coteries, communities, um, even fandoms, perhaps, since Lana Turner appears in this poem. Um, the word collapse is often used of quite large public structures. Um, you know, the, the, the stock market collapses, infrastructure collapses, a state collapses. And perhaps this is a poem that's interested in alternative models of togetherness that are gestured to in the way that celebrities can shape our collective attention and our um, affect and emotion and cultivate a kind of shared culture in a way that um, um, to, to create a, a different form of community from the sorts of communities that we think about when we think about nations and states and cities and geographies. Um, and it's interesting that as well as this I and this you in this poem, there is also a we, which only appears once and appears quite suddenly in this startling last line. And the only verb performed by this we is love. So those are just some other kind of um, ideas about how you might approach this short, sweet little poem. And I'll just leave you with a few more fragments. Um, so this is just from an essay by Susan Sontag, Notes on Camp, written quite, quite close to the same time as this poem was published um, and well worth reading. So just a few little quotes. Camp is a certain mode of asceticism. It is one way of seeing the world as an ascetic phenomenon. That way, the way of camp is not in terms of beauty, but in terms of the degree of artifice, of stylization. True, the camp eye has the power to transform experience, but not everything can be seen as camp. It is not all in the eye of the beholder. Camp sees everything in quotation marks. It's not a lamp, but a lamp. It's not a woman, but a woman. To perceive camp in objects and persons is to understand being as playing a role. It is the farthest extension in sensibility of the metaphor of life as theater. Um, can I make myself disappear? And yeah, I've, I've mentioned that I've taken another quote from a, a, a very recent book by Deborah Nelson called Tough Enough, talking about Susan Sontag, saying that she was a theorist often concerned with the struggle to retain agency over one's inner state and who understood aesthetics as a tool, not merely of apprehension and knowledge, but also of feeling management. I think um, someone whose thinking is very relevant to the kind of reading of the poem that we've been developing today. And that's, that's a page from the New York Post, February 9th, 1962. So I haven't, I haven't looked very hard, but I haven't found any newspaper that says Lana Turner has collapsed. Um, but this could have been the newspaper that the actual Frank O'Hara could have seen and might then have gone away and, and written this poem. It's possible. Lana faints in hospital.
Um, I suggested in an earlier video that being overly concerned with what the poet meant or intended um, or the circumstances of composition can unduly limit the understanding and interpretation of a text. So I have in this video deliberately kept back some of the anecdotal context of the poem, which might suggest a kind of quite different reading. So Ahara is actually supposed to have written this poem on a fairy on the way to a poetry event. So what if the you in this poem isn't an addressee, but rather addressees? What if it's an audience? Maybe, maybe the first you, uh, you said it was hailing, picks out an individual from the crowd in that kind of slightly swaggering manner that a stand-up comic does, preempting hecklers by projecting an authority grounded in wit, in unpredictability, and in the power to humiliate. And then maybe the second you is plural. Such a hurry to meet you. A kind of ingratiating address to the whole gathered assembly. So on this alternative um, reading or, or rudiments of a reading, rather than an intimate one-to-one -one poem, there's a kind of public address here, albeit um, a small public, a provisional community, a, maybe a scene, a coterie, um, a room full of people. It makes it more of a, an indoors poem than an outdoors poem. And it makes it, it, rather than being this kind of delicate, slightly nervous negotiation of the possibility of forgiveness without the possibility of apology, the poet is maybe showing off a little. Oh, this poem? Oh, uh, I just wrote this on the way over here. And you can tell it's true because it's filled with today's news. So if we took that assumption and continued with the reading, who knows what we might find if we spent an afternoon in the poem's company. But I am going to leave it there. So thank you very much. Bye.